It is always an honor to represent the Lord Jesus and always a privilege to minister his word. But I suppose this is true in a very unusual sense because of the circumstances surrounding this Founders Week, the 200th anniversary of our nation. Now, I suppose uh, it's proper for me to say I'm glad to be here, but I'm not going to say that. I'm just glad to be anywhere, and since Chicago is somewhere, I'll throw you along in with the rest of the world. (laughs) Now, I come to you with a tremendous handicap. Uh, I picked up a bug, but not in the windy city of Chicago. Believe it or not, I picked it up in the warm sunshine of Florida. It seems as though someone left a window open and influenza. And uh, (laughs) I was the victim. Now let us open our Bibles, please, to the book of James, the epistle of James, chapter 1. Let us pause for a brief word of prayer, please. Loving Father, we lift our hearts to Thee in thanksgiving and praise for our dear Savior, the Lord Jesus, for Thy Holy Word, the Bible, and for the Holy Spirit, our Teacher. Grant that during these moments We shall have open eyes and open ears, open minds and open hearts to receive and to retain some nugget of truth from the storehouse of wealth. Grant, O God, that we'll all be better people for having been here this hour. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As I considered our gathering together during these mornings and my responsibility to you, the Lord directed me to this epistle of James. I saw two possibilities in our series of studies. Number one, we could take a chapter and dwell on that chapter each day and thus conclude the five chapters in the five morning sessions. Or secondly, we might consider the purpose for the writing of this epistle and how that purpose is unfolded within the confines of chapter 1. I have chosen the latter. We'll be spending our five mornings in the first chapter of the book of James. First, let me suggest to you one of the divinely stated reasons for the writing of this epistle why the Spirit of God directed James, our brother, to pen these words. It's tucked away in verse 4. I'll begin reading with the first verse. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now it seems to me that we have in this fourth verse one of the reasons for the writing of this epistle, that ye may be perfect and entire or complete, wanting nothing. First, let us have an understanding as to the meaning of this word perfect. It does not mean sinlessly perfect. None of us reach the state or stage of sinless perfection in this life. Rather, it means mature, the reaching of a goal. In other words, the purpose for the writing of this epistle was to help the reader to grow up, to become mature. We speak of perfect manhood. It means that a man reaches his peak of maturity, especially in the athletic world. Then he's over the hill and he starts to go down on the other side. The legs give out. 
He doesn't have the same wind capacity that he had before. He reaches what we call perfect manhood or a state or stage of maturity. The word used here is the same word the Lord Jesus used in John 19.30 when he said from the cross, It is finished. Not I am finished, but it is finished. He had a goal, and he reached that goal. Now, the goal in the Christian life is growing up, becoming mature. I think that many of us realize the need for spiritual growth. In Australia, we have the tallest trees in the world, reportedly, the eucalyptus tree. They reach a height of 400, but not all eucalyptus trees reach their potential. Some are stunted in their growth for one reason or another. In America, we have the largest trees in the world, the sequoias in California. One of them is perhaps the the largest thing I have ever seen, the General Sherman. That's more than 270 feet tall, yet not all sequoias reach their potential. Where life begins, it ought to mature. It ought to develop. But unfortunately, it does not, as it should. Our nation is 200 years old. We have made amazing progress in 200 years. All of the modern inventions, discoveries, and developments seem to have come from this nation all within the last 100 years. Steam, electricity, the automobile, the airplane, telephone, telegraph, space travel, the development of the atomic bomb. All of this originated in this country within the last 100 years. But we seem to have reached a peak. We haven't arrived at our potential. But there is a strange deterioration in our society. Politically, economically, morally, educationally, something has gone wrong. I was reading the Founders Week highlights And on the front page, Dr. Sweeting said, It is no secret that our nation needs divine help. But few seem to understand that our hope as a nation lies in the hands of God's people. Our nation is no longer growing. Militarily, we are deteriorating. We are no longer the strongest nation in the world on land, in the air, and on the sea. Something is happening to our society. And if we're going to survive, their survival rests with God's people. And unless we grow spiritually and reach our potential, I see little hope for our nation. Before we look at James chapter 1, I want to suggest two passages of Scripture. Just lay them alongside of each other. 1 Peter 2.2 2 and 1 Corinthians 2. 3, 1. First Peter 2.2 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. In that verse we have suggested a legitimate babyhood as newborn babes. If you have been saved within the last year or two or three, then you are a newborn babe. That is a legitimate, a valid babyhood. But when Paul wrote to the Corinthians in chapter 3 of his first epistle, he said, And I, brethren, could not write unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. That was an illegitimate babyhood. They became victims of arrested development. They never grew up. It was the only charismatic church in the New Testament. Of no other church was it ever said that they had all the gifts, 1 Corinthians 1, 7. Here was a church with the spiritual gifts, but they were unspiritual. They never matured. They never developed. They never grew up. And the church was shot through with problems. Why? Immaturity. They never reached their 
potential. Now let us come to James chapter 1, and we'll deal in this first chapter with some tests that I hope you will join with me in taking during these days to determine our spiritual growth. Now remember, we take the test for ourselves. We do not take it for someone else. If your husband is not here, you can't take the test for your husband. If your wife is not listening, not present, or not able to get this message, you can't take it for your wife. Parents, we cannot take the test for our children. And young people, you cannot take the test for your parents. Each must take it for himself. I'm reminded of a farmer who never missed a service in his country church for more than 40 years. But a severe blizzard had blown in on a Saturday night, and not to be cheated out of his perfect record, the farmer got his plow out and plowed his way to church. Now it was his usual custom to greet the pastor after every Sunday morning sermon and say, Well, pastor, that was a great message. You surely gave it to them this morning. But this particular Sunday morning of the blizzard, no one was able to get out except the farmer who had plowed his way through. And when he arrived at the church, only he and the pastor were present. He said, Well, pastor, what do you think we ought to do? Well, the pastor said, I'll tell you what we'll do, George. We'll sing a duet. You pray, and I'll preach. So they sang the duet, and the farmer prayed, and the preacher preached, and on his way out to his plow, he said, Well, pastor, if they would have been here this morning, you surely would have given it to them. <laughs> now we're going to take some tests during these mornings. And the test will help us to determine for ourselves how we are doing spiritually. In the authorized version, the tests are found in texts containing words beginning with the letter T. Please note, test number one has to do with our trials, verses 1 through 12. The word temptation in verse 2 and the word temptation in verse 12 is better rendered trial. If you have an American Standard Version, you will see it clearly. Test number one has to do with our trials, verses 1 through 12. Test number two has to do with our temptations, verses 13 through 15. Test number three, please note verse 18 has to do with the truth of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. And test number four, in verse 26, has to do with the tongue. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Now, unless we have a true and false test, questions are presented. So here are the four test questions for our study. Number one, how do I react to my trials? How do I react to my trials as a mature or an immature person? Second, how do I resist temptation? Do I succumb to it? Do I yield to it as an underdeveloped, immature Christian? Or do I get victory over temptation? Test number three, how do I respond to the truth? Am I glad for the truth, even though it cuts me to shreds and shows me up for what I am? Or do I recoil, do I rebel when I hear the truth? How do I respond to the truth? Test number four, how do I restrict or restrain my tongue? The tongue test. Now, we'll get to the tongue test one of these days, and that'll be a very difficult one. Now, if you're thin-skinned, you won't come the day we take the tongue test. 
Of course, if you're not here, I'll know you're thin-skinned, that's for sure. Now, let's pursue test number one. How do I react to my trials? James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting, my brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations. I heard of a home Bible study group where some women had gathered to study the book of James. And someone said, what does that divers temptations mean? One woman said, well, one of them could be going down too deep. And, uh, <laughs> now, the word temptation in verses 1 through 12 means trials or tests. For example, in Genesis chapter 22 we read, And it came to pass that the Lord did tempt Abram. He did tempt Abraham. Now, usually we associate with the word tempt or temptation a solicitation to become involved in some sort of wrongdoing, some moral evil. Well, that is not so. It's an unfortunate rendering. The Lord tested Abraham. You have it borne out in Hebrews chapter 11. Abraham was tried when he offered up Isaac. Then, too, in Matthew chapter 4, the Lord Jesus was led of the Spirit to be tempted of the devil. Did the Holy Spirit solicit the Lord Jesus Christ to become involved in moral evil? Of course not. It was a trial. It was a test. So in James chapter 1, verses 1 through 12, the word tempt means trial or testing. I think the context will bear that out. For example, verse 3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith. Notice the word trying. Verse 12, blessed is the man that endureth temptation or trial, for when he is tried, contextually and exegetically, verses 1 through 12 deal with our trials. Now, all Christians have trials. All Christians are subject to testing. Man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. I cringe when I hear an evangelist make an appeal. Trust Christ as your Savior, and from here on, your life will be a pathway strewn with flowers. Don't ever believe it. I've been a Christian for 48 years, and I've had my heart broken on more than one occasion. If you haven't had yours broken, my friend, you just haven't lived long enough. Hang around for a while. You'll know what it is to weep. We are born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. How do I react to my trials? Now, we can take the test and discover for ourselves how well we're doing in this matter of growing up. Well, let's look at a few things in verses 1 through 5. First, the reaction to the trial. The reaction to the trial. Verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various kinds of trials. Well, that's an interesting expression, fall into. In Luke chapter 10, in verse 30, we have the story of the man who was making a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho. And en route he fell among thieves. He didn't anticipate it. He expected to have a safe, pleasant, pleasurable journey. But he fell among thieves, a trial he never anticipated. Now the scripture says, count it all joy when you fall into various kinds of trials. The reaction to the trial. If I'm growing up, it will be one of pleasantness. Now, what is my first reaction to my trials? It's quite revealing. It determines my maturity or immaturity. Pleasantness. Count it all joy when you fall into various kinds of trials. On one of my missionary trips to the Orient, I was involved in a serious automobile accident and sustained a broken right leg, broken knee. And they put me in a hospital in Tokyo, and 
set the leg and put it in a full cast from the hip to the ankle. And I traveled through Korea and Japan in that cast. Then before leaving the Orient, I was to return to the hospital for an examination and possibly and hopefully have the cast removed. They decided to remove the cast, put me on a table, and the little Japanese doctor who had trained in the Hanuman Hospital in Philadelphia took an electric saw and he started at the top of that cast and just cut through it down to the bottom. Then he broke it open and gently lifted my leg out. And my first reaction was, whew, is it good to get out of that miserable thing? Now the missionary who had been transporting me was sitting beside me. He leaned over, he said, Brother Strauss, James 1, 2 says, count it all joy when you're falling in, not when you're getting out. <laughs> I'd been preaching to those Orientals how to be a victorious Christian. Oh, I was waxing eloquent in that cast. But I wasn't too pleasant about it at times. Count it all joy when you fall into various kinds of trials. The reaction should be one of pleasantness. But you say, Brother Strauss, you can't be pleasant under all trials. No, not if we're not growing up. We can't. That's the whole purpose of the test. If we're immature and underdeveloped, if we have been victims of arrested development, if for one reason or another we are not maturing, the reaction will not be a pleasant one. Mrs. Strauss and I, God sparing us, until June 17th, will be married 45 years. They have been 45 wonderful years, not as wonderful as I would have liked them to be. But uh, when I started out, and we were married quite young, when I started out, I had a, an idea that ours would be the ideal marriage. Like, we'll never quarrel, will we, honey? And, uh, well, we got married and went to Atlantic City, New Jersey on our honeymoon. I'm not sure whether it was the third or the fourth day on the honeymoon, but this perfect marriage, and I had hoped that maybe someday, possibly in the 21st century, the Encyclopedia Britannica might have a page, the ideal marriage of the 20th century, the Lehman Strauss, Elsie Strauss marriage, and I was hopeful. But on the third or fourth day of the honeymoon, she blew it. I started to shave, and she said, Honey, but well, don't you wait until tonight to shave? Now, you people know that a woman who's never used a razor has no idea when a man ought to shave. <laughs> Here we are married a couple of days, and already she's telling me when to shave. I've been shaving already for 14 months. Well, there went the perfect marriage. Now, really, it wasn't what she said that created that little fuss on our honeymoon. It took me a long time to look back on that experience. It was my immature, unspiritual reaction to what she said. You know, I was married six years before I learned why she said, Honey, but don't you wait until tonight to shave? She wanted a smooth face. <laughs> I'm so dumb, I didn't realize that. Married six years before I discovered it. I have a friend who went away on a business trip for many weeks, and when he came back, he had grown a huge mustache. And some of his friends in the church were teasing him about it. And somebody said to his wife, how can you kiss him with that thing? Well, she said, I'll wade through any old briar patch to get to a good picnic. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently my wife wasn't willing to wade through a briar patch. And uh, 
But the point I'm making is, it wasn't what she said that upset me. It was my unspiritual, immature reaction. I hadn't grown up enough to allow her to express her opinion. Like the woman said to her husband, Honey, he said, Shut up. Well, she said, Dear, I'm just, Shut up, woman. He said, That's twice. And after a long wait, she crawled and said, Dear. He said, What is it? She said, I was just going to give you my opinion. He said, Shut up, woman. If I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. Now, well, we all have trials of one nature or another. But the way we react to the trial determines our spiritual growth. It's a detector. It's a revealer, you see. I was in Canada ministering, and a woman said, I want to give you a testimony about my husband. He's been saved for only three years, but he has grown more in three years than I have in more than 20 years of Christian experience. She said one evening, I said to him, what do you want in your lunch tomorrow? Well, he said, fix me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and fix the usual coffee in the thermos bottle. Well, she fixed his sandwich and he went to work the next day and found his usual spot at lunchtime, opened his lunchbox, bowed his head and thanked God for his food. And he removed a sandwich in a glad bag from the box, but when he opened the glad bag, he had an occasion not to be so glad. He looked at the sandwich and uh, took his finger and smeared a little and tasted it and discovered that his wife had loaded one side of the bread with jelly and had inadvertently, unintentionally, taken the mustard jar and loaded the other half of the bread with mustard. So he had a mustard and jelly sandwich. Well, he said, I thank God for it, I'll eat it. He was trying to get that mustard and jelly sandwich down. He wasn't doing so well. And, well, he thought he'd wash it down with coffee. So he poured out a, a cup of liquid and discovered that his wife had put the hot water in, added some milk, but forgot to put in the instant coffee. Well, he said, I thank God for that, so I'll drink it. So he washed down his mustard and jelly sandwich with hot water and milk. <clears throat> when he finished, he went to the telephone and called his wife. He said, honey, how are you feeling today? She said, fine. What's wrong? He said, nothing. Well, she said, you never call at lunchtime. There must be something wrong. No, he said, there's nothing wrong. She said, why did you phone? He said, I just phoned to thank you for the lunch. She said, you have never called to thank me for the lunch before. There has to be something wrong. What's wrong? Nothing. He said, I just called to thank you because this one was really different. <laughs> she said he came home, put his lunchbox down, took her in his arms, smashed a real good kiss on her lips and said, baby, you're the greatest. She said, Brother Strauss, before my husband was saved, he would have come home he might have thrown the lunchbox at me. He would have cursed. He was a man with a violent temper. But he reacts to his trials in such a mature way, he makes me feel ashamed of myself. The reaction to the trial, if I'm growing up, count it all joy. Now, secondly, look at the reason for the trial. The reason for the trial is in verse 3. If the reaction to the trial should be pleasantness, the reason for the trial is patience. Do you see it in verse 3? Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. God knows what he is doing. Sometimes we Christians feel as though we're carrying all the burdens of the world. And we say to some, oh, but you don't know my problem. Mine's different. No, beloved, yours is no different. Yours is no different. Paul warned the Corinthians against uttering that alibi. Don't think it's strange when some trial comes to you as though some strange thing has happened unto you. Peter gives the same exhortation. Trials are no different from anyone else's. Beloved, God's trying to work something in us, to develop in us that beautiful virtue of patience. And when Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 5, he said, 
Tribulation worketh patience. There's a reason for the trial. God knows why he allows the trials to come to us. Paul had a thorn in the flesh. He did what most Christians do when they get into trouble or have a trial. He prayed that God would heal him. Prayed three times in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And God had to interrupt him as he was praying and say, Paul, you're asking for the wrong thing. You're asking for the wrong thing. I'm not going to heal you, Paul. It isn't healing that you need. But he said in verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 12, My grace is sufficient for thee. You see, Paul needed to learn the sufficiency of the inexhaustible grace of God. He needed to learn how to draw from the infinite resources of God's divine grace. The reason for the trial is patience. I wonder if there's anyone in the audience, as I turn back in my Bible to chapter 10 of Hebrews, just two pages, I wonder if there's anyone in my audience who does not need patience. Will the liar please stand? <laughs> Look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 36. For ye have need of patience. I need patience. And God knows when to send the trial, how stiff the trial ought to be, until God finishes with me, working in me that which he longs to see in all of his children, the beautiful virtue of patience. The reaction to the trial, verse 2, is pleasant as if we're growing up. The reason for the trial is patience. If we're underdeveloped spiritually, we'll never see it. We'll carp and criticize and complain and find fault. We'll have a nasty attitude. Our reaction, oh, it'll be so unpleasant. But then look at the next thing in the context, the resource during the trial. Verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let her go to the telephone and call your closest friend. No, I'm sorry. That's the reversed vision. If any of you lack wisdom, get to the pastor as fast as you can. Well, now the pastor might be a good man to go to. And if he's a good pastor, he won't mind pastoral work. He might not appreciate pastoral work. Don't make a pest of yourself. But if he's a good pastor, he'll appreciate pastoral work. But if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. The reaction to the trial is pleasantness. The reason for the trial is patience. The resource during the trial is prayer. Now let me ask you, where do we intuitively, instinctively turn when the trials and the tribulations come to us? Do we intuitively and instinctively lift our hearts to God in prayer? Is God the first resource? When the going gets rough, then you lack wisdom. I tell you, I don't need wisdom when everything's going as I planned. I have a printed schedule that tells me where I will be every day during 1976. But it's always the Lord willing. God may have some changes en route. And if he does... I don't know what I'll do when the trial comes wherever I am. But I know one thing, beloved. I have access to the throne of grace. If any of you lack wisdom, and oh, how we need wisdom when the trials come, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Well, our time has expired for this session. God willing, we'll... Come back again tomorrow, and if the Lord comes before tomorrow, you won't need me. All the problems <laughs> will be solved. Let us bow for prayer. And now, loving Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word and for the privilege of sharing once again in divine truth. Seal that truth to our hearts, and may we all be a little taller spiritually for having come today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.